Good afternoon. Thank you for coming here at this session. In brief, I'll explain what are we going to do. The organizers asked us to hold this particular session to talk about what we are doing these days in this very region, region of Kaliningrad, and also talk about this wonderful event that happened. This very ribbon, we cut that ribbon today. This is the first engineering center which was constructed and commissioned in Russia only to serve the projects which will be operating abroad. We've been very active in working with the Ministry for Higher Education and Science, Economic Development. We've been cooperating with the Foreign Investment Advisory Council and the Association of European Businesses. So I know very well what is happening in this sector today. And we are the first who created such a center. And I will do my best now to explain to you the reason for the existence of that center. I will tell you what we are going to do and how we selected the place to construct it. I will also tell you about the work which we will be doing in cooperation with various universities. Later on, we will have one of the professors coming here. He is one of the champions of the idea to create a, an educational consortium. So he will tell you on how the educational aspect of our work is structured. So I probably will begin by telling you, in short, who I am and what company I represent and what we are doing. I represent the ABB company. This company is one of the biggest producers of automation systems in the world for electrical equipment, for industrial equipment, for networks. We are one of the three major producers of various industrial robots. We are one of the three largest producers of electric engines, power drives, transformators, in other fields, we are currently leaders. Our company employs over 140,000 people. We sell products for over $40 billion annually. We have a lot of manufacturing platforms in Russia. 18 months ago, had of the automation division of the ABB came here. I said that we are the biggest suppliers of SUV systems. And we succeeded in convincing him that Russia is a very good country to develop engineering competences. These days, we are engaged in the field of digital solutions, and that is why we concentrate our efforts on promoting digital competences. I think here I should talk about that word, digital, which recently have become of very much hype. This is a very much hype word again. And unfortunately, it's been overused. But you should understand that there are a number of key aspects of that term that should be remembered when discussing digitalization in the industry. Unfortunately, in Russia, digitalization is not that widespread. Though still, digital economy is a thing in Russia. It's quite prominent in banking, in 
the internet, in the healthcare, in the other spheres as well. So Russia is very much advanced in terms of uh, digitalizing everything in these sectors. As for industry, this is not the case so far. If you look at the digitalization program of the Russian Federation, it does not include enough ideas to develop industries in that direction. If we talk about our global experience, we already have a lot of success stories. And we believe that Russia can also be another success story of us. First, we concentrate on creating the necessary infrastructure for data storage and transmission. And here is our professor, Mr. Yurov, with some very funny backpack. Mr. Yurov will be representing our educational front. Could you please provide our engineers with your flash drive, with your memory stick, please? And in the meantime, I will be telling you how we progressed in the field of digitalizing industries. Well, we started with data storage and data transfer technologies. All of the time, these solutions became way cheaper. Ten years ago, it was first coming to the industries on a small scale. But now, it all has changed. These technologies, these solutions are very prominent in computers, smartphones, in consumer goods sector. And that has helped to improve the reliability of these technologies, which allowed us to introduce them to the systems of automation, to digital solutions for industries. It is true that we have a number of issues these days. I mean, cybersecurity, for one. And also, the problems which have to do with cybersecurity, but it's not cybersecurity per se. We have now isolated system and non-isolated systems. Sometimes to ensure security, we have to isolate systems. But almost every automated system is not secure by definition, because there is a human factor. And we need to eliminate this factor in order to ensure highest possible security. Under that human factor, I mean that your system can be fully proved from accessing the Internet, but you have an operator that that man or woman can go on holidays, log into that computer at the workplace, and that's it. A virus can come in. It can breach the system passing through the firewall. And endanger the whole thing. That's the background information for you. What are the prospects for digital transformation in the industries? These are new technologies. Now I'll pass over to the construction of this center. We first became interested in construction such a center a while ago. We thought it would serve not only Russia, but also probably not also, but primarily Europe. And the task we were given was to select the place which would be best suitable to work for Europe. We were in competition for finding a place in Russia, not in Croatia or India, in the Czech Republic or anywhere else. We wanted to build it in Russia. And to do that, we had to prove that key competences are strong in Russia, and education is very, very good in Russia. And that's what my colleague is going to talk about. The second task we were given is to select the site for this center. And this project is unique because of the fact that we were the first ones who, for the first time in many years, applied a systemic approach to selecting the best site first criteria was very well qualified workforce then universities that could reorganize and streamline their education 
to prepare the workforce for this center. And third, we started to calculate the, the costs of such an operational center. And to do that, we created a special model which helped us to calculate operational expenditure for various centers of various size. We calculated the workforce expenditure, the traveling and the time which every person will need to get in and out of the center. All these calculations helped us a lot. And also the Ministry of Economy helped us a lot. Director of the Department for Innovative Development personally helped us to select 15 cities. Then we compared these 15 cities, finding the best one, the, the one where operational expenditures will be the lowest. And we reduced this list to 10 cities. And out of these 10 cities, we started to assess them to come there in person and see how good they were. We went to 10 cities, all of them. We visited over 30 universities and analyzed every educational program of these universities. We also checked these cities for competitors for some other industries, which could be using the same workforce people with the same kind of education we require. What kind of education? First, automation processes. Second, electrical engineering. And third, programming. These three competencies are paramount for us. If you talk about digital transformation, then you need to have that three-headed hydra tamed and ready to serve you. Some people work on hardware, some people work on software, some people need to calculate all the things and create real physical systems based on all these online and offline solutions. And that is why we concentrated on finding people with these three competencies. After that stage, we embarked on choosing benchmarks. We chose the, our center in India and the Czech Republic as benchmarks. Both centers are very big, over 500 people each. We looked through their package of contracts, and the contracts they signed is actually bigger than they can swallow. That is why we decided to create one in Russia, by the way. So we started to analyze how those centers were getting the workforce, where they were finding people to work for them, and how they were nurturing these students to then welcome them as full-fledged workers. The universities in the city of Australia in the Czech Republic was taken as the example we looked into the uh, educational program, into their courses, which we deemed most useful for our course. And as for all other things related to that, I will ask Mr. Yurov to talk about that, because he was in charge of comparing the Estrada's university programs with what we had in place here. So Konstantin Ponomarev, pro-rector of Skalter, he came up with that kind of consortium of six universities, five Russian universities, and BFU is the key coordinator between them, and one foreign university, the university in Estrava in the Czech Republic. And of course, the Kaliningrad World Polytech, Skoltech, two universities in the city of Tomsk, and one in the Czech Republic. So he analyzed the programs of every university and came up with a very interesting matrix, and he will probably talk about that matrix now. Can we please have my slide on the screen? 
Ну хорошо. Давайте я скажу сейчас несколько слов. Okay, let me first say a couple of words. Since I wasn't here at the beginning, let me reiterate that the idea was to bring the engineering education to a new level because it was going downhill. But the idea was to work together with a major company that is working right now, that works. We needed a company or a corporation. And that is why we decided to do it uh, together with the ABB company, because it is a true giant in its sector. And if we succeed in uh, training people who the ABB company uh, will be happy to employ, then it would mean that our graduates will be welcomed uh, by any company in any country. And that was our in initial idea. So what Mikhail has just said is um, we did use the Ostrava University as a benchmark. Uh, they train engineers for ABB. And that is why we started our work as follows. We looked at the educational courses at the Slava University and we looked into them to design our own courses for automation, uh, programming and electronics. So we finally have the slides on the screen. We started to uh, to analyze their programs and to come up with um, decisions for our own educational uh, programs. But the question was whether a single university is capable of carrying out such a major task. And that is why we decided to create a consortium of um, universities that would work together, uh, joining their competences and joining their skills. From the very beginning, we had a skill list, a number of competences that uh, ABB gave to us. Of course, we couldn't simply duplicate the courses of the Ostrava University. That is why we adopted our courses, working together with our colleagues from Tomsk or from the Kaliningrad Technological University. These are joint uh, curriculums, joint um, programs of several universities, of a consortium. As you all know, uh, together uh, we opened a, an ABB engineering center here in the Kaliningrad region, which is very important for us because we train people who will possibly be ABB's um, future employees. We started with the bachelor degree. Uh, it is a four-year uh, program and master's degree is a two-year program, as you all know, and ABB did hope for a quick result. Well, the slides are in English, as you can see, and our um, classes will be in English as well. So uh, the first program is Information Systems for Automated Production, then Development of Software for um, Automated Industrial Facilities, and electrical power engineering and electrical engineering. Uh, so we worked um, on the basis of the Ostrava University's uh, courses. And we, what we did, we formed a, a nucleus of skills that we needed to teach. 
Now let us speak about the program structure. Uh, you have on this slide the main universities of the consortium, uh, Skoltech, Kaliningrad's Technological University, and Baltic Federal uh, University. You know, I make the same mistake as you. I do not say technological, I say technic. Don't say it to him. So we also have here VSB and Scott Tech, which are a little bit separate from the other universities because they act as advisors. So they teach the teachers. Yes, you can put it this way. They monitor the quality, and we are at the bottom. BFU's role is central here, because first of all, it is located very favorably, uh, I mean, in terms of geography. And of course, uh, our university is coordinating the work of the consortium. So we have two uh, sets of tasks. First, we design the curriculum, educational programs, and we coordinate the work of the consortium. We have two master degrees uh, programs. You also have on the slide the names of the people who are in charge of these uh, programs. And it may soon change because our colleagues uh, persuaded a person from Skoltec to head one of the education programs. So what we did, we analyzed the number of people who graduated from um, engineering schools, universities. Um, let me just tell you that Russia now goes through some very hard times when it comes to engineers. Because looking at the number of people who study physics, for example, I do not understand how we will train enough engineers. Uh, we are all trying uh, to take this responsibility and to make up for what has been happening for so long, and that is why we are working together with ABB. If we look at the number of bachelors, who graduated in uh, 2018, then the number of graduates from our consortium universities uh, is quite high. And why we are so interested in them is because potentially they will take uh, their master's degree at our uh, consortium, at our universities. So the whole thing starts in September um, 2019. It will be a full-time two-year program, and uh, graduates will uh, obtain their master's degree. Uh, the whole course will be in English, and partly the program is already uh, accredited, and what is more important, there is no tuition fees. Why Baltic University became a coordinator? Because we are very close to ABB, first, and second, which is very important. The point is the education uh, the Russian education is a pretty difficult thing. These very uh, tough requirements and standards that keep changing and changing in a blink of an eye. Sometimes uh, it seems to me that all these standards are aimed at making people quit schools and universities, at making that drop out. There are so many ministerial requirements. It is very good that the Ministry for Education was separated into two uh, ministries, but still the requirements are there. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we as a company uh, do not care about these standards because we have completely different criteria 
for evaluating skills and competences. We are not interested in these uh, red tapes, um, pra red tape practices, and papers at ministries. So when the head of the Baltic University tried to um, try to explain us all of the details and then when I tried to uh, explain it all to our foreign colleagues going into detail then uh, my foreign colleagues would seem absolutely discombobulated uh, they would say we just need engineers and they couldn't understand why this education program should comply with some standards I'm sorry for interrupting well you know, I was way tougher speaking about that normally. Federal universities in Russia, and if I'm not mistaken, we have 10 or 11 of them. Well, the 11th is in Crimea, naturally. Um, they have their own regulations they can have their own educational standards and that is a very hard work because you should agree this stand agree on the standards with ministries and other bodies you should properly document them so if we wanted to use the Ostrava University's courses as a benchmark, we really had to do uh, some serious work because these courses, they go beyond our standards. And we really took up a lot of effort to, a lot of efforts to do that. And we have now uh, a planned figure of 150 graduates per year. But they will not go nowhere after the graduation. They will be employed by um, ABB and other companies. They will work at the engineering center that was opened. And I believe 150 will be enough for the center. Um, isn't it? Well, we can scale up. For us, it was very important to employ people, uh, to find our potential employees, and we were uh, recruiting up and down the country. And we had a special program for human capital relocation, we had mortgage programs. The region did so much, and that is why we are so grateful uh, to the governor and to Dmitry Puskov from the ministry. They all worked very actively because uh, the mission seemed absolutely impossible to do something like that in a year time or even in half a year time. So now we have these uh, young people at our offices in Ostrava, and they have their new interest in life. But if we'll be able to take more qualified people on board quickly, that will be nice. So what do we have now? And let me tell you that uh, the program will be launched in September. Uh, our colleagues from Tomsk opened the enrolling, the enrolling procedure. What we did is we took some of our programs that we already have, um, some software courses, automation courses, and our friends from another university, they also decided to work on their already existing uh, program and we adapted these programs to to ABB's requirements 
And for our colleagues, this task proved to be harder because um, the requirements that they had to meet were much tougher. Starting from this year, though, we will have programs similar to that of the Ostrava universities. Of course, they will not be identical. There are some uh, adjustments and modifications. What we needed is to look at what they do when it comes to some applied um, practices. So this slide um, has all of the necessary information on collaboration, on the courses that we have, for example, how the Balkan University works, uh, how the Botk University um, uh, works with the Tomsk University. And let me tell you that this is what we have now, but it might change, though the essence, of course, will not change. We do expect that some people will leave, but new people will come. We do not want our consortium to be too big. Five universities or six universities are enough. Uh, there are two more universities that are willing to join. We have the Ivanov University, and the uh, governor of the region is an old friend. And we also have some nice relations with the uh, Pertov Veliki um, University. Of course, we always face issues and challenges. We keep wondering whether the Ostrava University will stay. Probably it will not. Then we will be joined by a university in India. So what I'm saying is that it is all changing. We are growing. Here on this slide, you see the same kind of classification, but it's a bit different. Here you can see the exact disciplines and subjects we'll be teaching, and that's the same kind of slide. I'm not going to go deep into that. These are just the technicalities. I'm showing you this that to show you that we have already created the curriculum. We approbated it. It has been adopted and is workable. And we went to Ostrava and they said, yes, that's good. If it fits Astrava, if it fits ABB, then it fits us, right? Do I say it correctly? ABB is satisfied with this program? Well, you know, I said that we actively participated in the work of the Foreign Investment Advisory Council, and for many years I was one of the coordinators in the group of innovative development. One of the tracks of its operation was cooperation with the high universities. And at some point, we realized it was very easy to criticize. We were criticizing a lot the existing programs. We had a wonderful dialogue with the Ministry of Education. We discussed about various programs, and they offered us to participate in the process of enhancing the standards. And we realized that we had no competence in place to achieve that. We could criticize them, but we could not offer anything better. We were good at producing very good equipment, hardware, software, but we did not know how to be good at education. We could not produce good educational programs. That is why we decided to find partners among the higher institutions. And with them, we decided to create new courses, new programs, new degrees. We could show them what equipment should be in place, what subjects should be studied. We could give them our vision, our outlook, our understanding of the tendencies. And in Russia, that can be done very successfully, I think, because in Russia, the fundamental disciplines, the fundamental disciplines which Russia is very good at can be wonderfully coupled with something new. And under fundamental disciplines, I mean physics, mathematics, material research and studies, 
Or that can be coupled with something new, something innovative, which requires you to be aware of the trends and tendencies. That wonderful coupling gives us the foundation for digital engineering. When they say about entrepreneurship and other things, other wonderful, beautiful words, it all sounds good. But we, when it comes to practice, you need fundamental knowledge. You need fundamental competencies. And I give the floor back to our professor here. Yes, you are right. You are largely right. That's how matters stand today. Ah, no, well, that should be the presentation. And further on in the presentation, you see the laboratories we have, and you can see what they do. I think it's good to show that because the topic of our discussion is digital engineering, and you should really see that it's not about just some empty talking about entrepreneurship. No, this is hardware, this is software, this is fundamental mathematics which you need to study thoroughly. It's digital, yes, but it's fundamental. Without fundamental knowledge like the one you have, it's impossible to go digital, right? Well, thank you for your kind words. I would like to compliment you in return, but I need time to come up with a better compliment. As for laboratories, we have an interesting story. We have a number of uh, facilities, but usually facilities are not where they are most needed. In the Ostrava University, we have a number of very talented guys from PIGBIK2. They are very, very clever, very promising. I've been looking forward to take them on board at my university, but probably that will not happen. So I'm sorry for jumping onto another topic, but you see, we started with sending a couple of uh, experts to laboratories. We were joined by people from the ABB. We were showing them the equipment, the hardware, the kind of people. They said, yeah, the equipment is outdated. But still, it was good enough. When we went to Ostrava, we decided to look at the laboratories they had. As for programming and coding, well, we were not impressed because it, you can solve it in a very simple way, and we really solved that problem at our university. But when it came to the Estrava's robotics laboratory, that was interesting. I asked my colleagues, what do you think about that? They said, well, that's good. It looks like the ones we have, and this piece of equipment is also similar to the one we have, but they are newer. We have the same kind of hardware, but it's a bit outdated. So we are not too far behind. We just need to modernize at a better pace. And some bits of equipment we have is just on par with the equipment they have. The KGTU University had the worst, the worst laboratory. It's the most outdated. Other laboratories are better, so I put them on my presentation because I'm not embarrassed to show them. They are really good. You can see them up there on the slides. This is Tomsk. This is laboratory at the Kaliningrad Technological University. And this is my thank you. Thank you for your attention. So in conclusion, the bottom line is that we have a number of master's degrees. They will be in operation starting from September this year. In summer, we will announce the enrolling. We will do the PR activities so that we have as many people as possible. We need to find for those wonderful diamonds, for those wonderful talents out of the ordinary mass of people. And to reach out to these talents, we need to inform as many people as possible. We are supported by the regional authorities. Mikhail said that Elihanov and Kuskov and other Official supporters, that's true. We already discussed the financing, and the regional budget is going to allocate the money for us. I'm not going to give you the exact figures, but we will be financed very well. These are technicalities. We cut the ribbon. 
Yesterday we had the session of the consortium, and now I know that the train of progress is up and running, and I'm really glad to see that. Thank you, Professor. Well, the train is up and running. The train of progress is here, and I hope that on our way we will be expanding the scope of our activities. At this very forum today, I invited our robotics department to participate, and I think that robots and discrete automation is the most demanded area in Russian industries. Why? Because if you look at the robot robotics market in Russia, it's around $50 million. It's nothing. It's a very small sum. Take any other developed country, they have that market way bigger than we have. Why so? Well, that's something historical. Robots are not expensive, but it is expensive to integrate them. But that can be done with the local means. You can use local resources. And also, it is difficult sometimes to understand how to use robots to the best of their ability. On the TV, we see a lot of things, a lot of advertising that robots are good, fast, cheap. That's true. But we tell you something different. Robots, first and foremost, serve to enhance the output, make your manufacturing processes more efficient, reduce human mistakes, and solve the demographic problem even, because many Russian regions are in deep demographic troubles. There are no people who want to come and work. People travel outside of their regions. And robotics can solve that. Kaliningrad, for instance. The region of Kaliningrad is not that big in terms of its population. So here, these technologies could spur up the output, the effectiveness of the manufacturing industry. Second, robots are a very good example that everything is becoming cheaper year by year. So the equipment, the chips, the electronics is becoming cheaper. That is why we need to promote competences which would be used for integrating solutions. We need to understand and to make others understand that robots are very effective in financial terms. Visit any large manufacturing facility. I've been to many automobile facilities, automobile plants. Usually you would see robots only at the biggest lines, the mainstream lines. As for subsidiary lines, there are no robots usually. Why so? Because it is difficult to find the basis, economic basis for using robots on the sidelines. It takes a lot of time, a lot of efforts to prepare the documentation and explain why this is tangible, why this will be giving you profit. Digital solutions and automated solutions are very close in meaning. And the biggest problem we have today in the industry is that we lack competences. We lack people who could explain why robots are very effective. They help you to cut the costs. Again, what the, the problem is that the major assembly lines are automated and all the subsidiary lines are not automated. That leads to irrational overuse of resources, low output, high expenditure, and bad environment. These are the consequences. And we will address these consequences later on. We will address the consortium and the universities to find a way to cure that disease. We need to find the justification for the use of robots. We need to explain why they need to be in place. There is a thing, it's called proactive sales. It's when a company, a supplier company, should help the consumer company 
to find reasons to buy this or that product, I mean, economically. And that's what we will be doing, I think. We'll be helping companies realize that they need robots to cut costs and enhance output. There is small output production, there is large output production. We'll work with all companies, small and big. Professor, let's turn to you now. Yes, that's all very interesting, and probably I should have taken with me here Alexander, my colleague, because he sees his cup of tea. He has a lot of interesting ideas. One of the ideas we had, and sorry if I diverge from the main line of conversation here. So that idea was to conduct an experiment. We conducted that experiment two years ago. We took three universities. Physical, University of Physics, University of Natural Sciences, and another university. So we came together and we decided to formulate a program which would help us to prepare such specialists that would be able to innovate. So we wanted to find a way to bring to life innovators who would be spot on on all the new technologies and all the advancements. What we see today is an explosion of new technologies. They come every day. We probably know the Moore's law. He predetermined, pre determined our growth today. He simply said, well, you need a business plan to be successful. You need to look into the future for two or three years to be successful. And that's what we have. I'm sorry for diverging so much, but I'm just really passionate about the topic. So we wanted to have a group of people who would be aware of what they have now. So the idea was not to teach people what the trends are today, but what they be tomorrow when they graduate. We needed specialists in biotechnologies or other types of um, technologies. They need to be able to understand what uh, kind of sectors will be feasible economically. And they need to be able to come up with a business plan. So the uh, attempt was to do something like that. And unfortunately, we failed because we followed our economic expert, experts who made it all contract. People had to pay for it. If it wasn't like that, if there were no tuition fee, it would be different. And probably what I think now, what has just occurred to me, is we should revive that program. Somehow maybe it will prove effective. Probably we will be able to teach people how to anticipate trends and understand technologies um, so deeply that they will be able to monetize them. Well, I believe that was the right thing to say since you're so tired to catch your attention. Professor, you are true. It is something that catches attention. But still, uh, let me stress two things. First of all, we should understand whether we look really deep into the subject or we stay on the surface. For example, what I need in my job, I need to stay on the surface. I just need to understand what happens. And you know, I envy our engineers who, who are younger, who are smarter, who have a really deep understanding. 
they are now studying and they become professionals in some very near subject. They do not really know anything outside of their scope of um, expertise, but they will with time. When I myself was an expert in a very narrow subject, I wrote my thesis. But when you work in a company, you need something else. But the idea is to train professionals with a truly deep understanding. And thank you so much for a program and for the consortium. But what they also need to be able to do is to do feasibility studies, is to do ROI studies. Sometimes it would be on the verge of, you know, popular science. And if you say open a program called digital engineering, people will go there. But if you will have a very narrow educational course, for example, coding for systems of such and such class, um, then it won't be the case. And from the point of view of a company, since we have to analyze a lot of what is happening on the education market, we see one more problem with universities. Professor said that they plan to have 150 graduates from six universities. When I myself was a student, each university had very little programs, but there were many graduates for each of these programs. Now it is not the case. Now each university is pursuing its potential students. And that is why universities come up with more and more educational programs. But what we see is the number of graduates that we are interested in. It is not enough. 150, it is not enough. The Ostrava University has 500 graduates, so you can employ them. They're nicely trained and well qualified. And when you have 150 graduates from six universities, that is not enough. And if we go back to my idea of each and every university having their own uh, remit falling within a very narrow remit, that would be nice. Thank you very much. Maybe there are some questions in the audience. Yekaterina Stolcova, High School of Economics. First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It was a true pleasure uh, to listen to you two uh, talking. I have two questions. Unfortunately, I wasn't here from the very beginning. So my first question is about the engineering center. I understand why it is opened here, but it is a scalable case. Or is it just a center that will only grow here in this particular location? And the second question is about your master's program. I understand that you've added new content, but structurally, I um, do not quite get it. Will the, the graduates be trained in universities and then they will be employed by this engineering center? Or probably you have some, some ways for them to to practice, to put their knowledge to practice. So 
what is the connection between uh, your master programs and this engineering center? How do you intertwine them? Well, let me speak first about how you scale up if you do. Well, if we understand uh, this concept similarly, then I believe our project is scalable in several dimensions, if you will. And let me clarify. I've said that now we have as many people as we were able to find. And if we have good economy, if we have good market, that might change. Why we are so proud with our center is uh, because many businesses make their choices not systematically. If you look at companies who look for a place to open their centers or to do something else, they do it quite chaotically. Somebody knows someone, but we tried. And what we did, we took a systemic approach. And consortium is scalable. It goes without saying that it is scalable. And what we do today, we do not do it solely for IBB, we do it for the region because as soon as we brought these competences, the skills, we virtually taught universities what they have to teach their students. Of course, I want our employees to give lectures at these universities. And of course, the students will spend some time at our company. Well, I have nothing to add here. You said it all. Apart from that, I think that students will develop their own projects. And that is what I discussed with our team at the center. We discuss what are the key issues that they face with people who come to work at the center. Graduates, they're very nice, they're very smart, but they never had their own projects. Uh, they never did something independently, and they do not have an understanding of how they can do that. When I was a student, uh, during our five-year curriculum, we would work at all sorts of enterprises and companies. We saw how they work. Now it is not the case. And I know, for example, that software companies face a huge challenge here because they have graduates uh, coming who do not understand what they should do and how they should do that. And going back to your question, we now establish criteria for training labor force that we will later on work with. So that is a system that will be used by anybody who will follow us. So we are first movers, if you will. Universities who now have these courses, they will not train people only for us. They will train them for other companies as well. For example, we talked to the um, aid to the Swedish ambassador. We uh, talked with our Swiss colleagues. And if tomorrow a Swedish company or a Swiss company or a Russian company understands that there is something that they're interested in, they will work with universities as well. That is why the governor is so much invested in this, because it is important for the region. The consortium, as I've mentioned, is scalable, and it can be brought to other regions. 
We now have uh, three programs. We have automation, software, and uh, electronic technologies. But the same um, framework may be done for mechanical engineering, for optic engineering, for all sorts of um, programs. And maybe they will have a company, a different company that will help them, that operates in a different sector, and they will work in the city of uh, Tambov or in the city of Saratov or in Tulyati. So it all depends on the skills that are in demand in this or that region. That is why the ministry support us because we now design a model that can be then used in so much more cases. We now have young active governors who are eager to change things and they can use it. Of course, labor force is very important too. Why aren't we in Tomsk? Tomsk is a wonderful city for us. We could have chosen Tomsk. It's a wonderful place. But there is one thing. We are an engineering center. And we know that people will be flying to us. And our workers will be flying to other companies. That is why we need to be close to Europe, to border. We need to be mobile. And that is why we chose this particular site to construct our engineering center. Yes, you answered it all, but there is one thing I would like to add. I will just give you some figures. Five years of study and half a year or one year of uh, internship. We want to complete the program in two years. So every student will have two years to complete the course, and half a year will be given to internships. You are too tired, probably. It's